Well, good morning, Walden Church. Next week is Palm Sunday, and so we will cover that story next week. But while Jesus is in Jerusalem, uh, there is some teaching that we won't have time to cover since the lessons following will be Good Friday and Easter morning. So we're going we're gonna to jump ahead so that we can jump back. Does that make sense? Last week, I mentioned that the tone of the book of Matthew is going to get a lot more serious, more sad, and it's only because we're all heading towards the cross, and Jesus knows it. And that means that the time is also running out. Jesus is looking to say everything he needs to say, do everything he needs to do, and he, he has to get as much done as he can right now which makes this, Matthew chapter 23, a very tough chapter. It's probably Jesus' harshest words, his strictest teachings, and he says all of this towards religious people. Pastor and author John MacArthur says Jesus' words in this page fly from his lips like claps of thunder and spears of lightning. Out of his mouth on this occasion, come the most fearful and dreadful statements that Jesus uttered on earth. The heading in your Bible might be uh, the seven woes. Woe is the Greek word ouai, and it's an interjection of grief. It's sadness, it's disbelief, it's disappointment, and even a little bit of judgment. Verse 1 says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. And my first fear is that we would read these words and our brain immediately shifts to, well, these words are not for me. But let's remind ourselves that the scribes and the Pharisees of this day were the most revered, most respected people. We always think of them in the ba- as, as the bad guys in the story, but nobody else who lived back then thought that way, including them. In their own heart of hearts, these religious leaders felt that they were being very righteous and that they were right in their beliefs. So we cannot read these words and stand back and think, well, these words don't apply to me, or these words only apply to other religions. That's a dangerous way to read the Bible. All of this is God's word, 100% of it, the red words and the black words, all of it. And Jesus believed all of it. Jesus supported all of it. Jesus fulfilled all of it. And the danger for us today is to read the scriptures and to believe that these words apply to someone else. These words are here for everyone, even us especially if the scribes and Pharisees truly believed they honored and obeyed God. Don't you believe that you honor and obey God? And for that matter, so do other religions. Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, devout Muslims, devout Catholics, devout Jews. And I would say the same thing. These words of Jesus, his harshest words, his strictest words are for all of us. So here's my humble suggestion. If Jesus has seven woes, seven judgments, then we, as good students, as disciples, we follow, we should uh, flip these on their heads as best as we can and find the, the opposite or the, the good commands, the, the lessons in how we should walk. If Jesus Jesus is speaking to illegitimate children, then we should learn and use these judgments to grow as authentic children, as authentic Christians. Matthew 23, verse 1 says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe what they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach but do not practice. What does that mean, Moses' seat? Well, during the Exodus, Moses was, for a while there, the only judge the people had. They would bring all of their disputes to him. After all, Moses had just brought down the law. Uh, He had spoken to God face to face. So who better than to settle disputes? Who better to speak with God's authority? 
And Jesus says, you know, you guys, you guys say you're as righteous as Moses, and, and that gives you the power to teach and the power to judge God's children. But Jesus says, but you don't even follow your own teaching. Do you know what that's called? It's called being a hypocrite. And this is our first danger. And this is perhaps our biggest pitfall. Christians seem to take it upon themselves to determine who is and who is not a heretic. And we do it so often that we have forgotten that the word Jesus used the most, in fact, the H word that Jesus used the most, was not heretic. It was hypocrite. In fact, in this first opening line here, these first few sentences, this is the thesis statement for all the rest of the teaching. And it's, and it's going to line up with the last three weeks uh, where we've been speaking about humility. A person who judges the world for heresy is placing themselves in the judgment seat instead of Christ. And God says, no, no, no. Judgment and revenge, those are mine. And now Jesus' biggest complaint towards these religious people was not that they didn't preach against and outroot heresy, because believe me, they did. No, the biggest complaint he had with them was that they were hypocrites. And when asked of the world how the world sees us, the world would agree. Author Brendan Manning says the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him by their life. And that is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. We have to practice what we preach. Right? We have to practice what we preach. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. In other words, don't copy them. You have to do better than that. That's not the goal. Your goal should be higher than that. Now, does that mean we have to be perfect? Absolutely not. Does that mean we don't make mistakes? And then if we did make a mistake, does that mean we'll be condemned for that mistake? No way. But see, the mistake the Pharisees made was pride. They believed they were perfect. They believed they were better. And if we were to preach Jesus, then we must also preach humility. And we have to preach service. For the Pharisees, pride was their biggest problem. And pride is our biggest problem. And God wants to free us from it. This week, an actor walked up on stage on live TV and hit another actor out of anger because their pride was hurt. Listen, God does not call us to pride or anger or judgment or revenge ever. C.S. Lewis called pride the great sin. In his book, Mere Christianity, he said, according to Christian teachers, the essential vice, the utmost evil is pride, unchastity, anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. Look at Matthew 23, verse 4. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. And then a little further down in verse 12, he says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. What is Jesus concerned with? Humility, right? Humility. We keep coming back to humility. The Pharisees and scribes were not authentic because they were not humble and they did not serve. Next, in verse 5, he says, They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi by others. Wow, that's a big word. What is a phylactery? Well, they were little boxes, or big boxes in this case, uh, and they contained Bible verses. 
and they would wear these boxes on their arms or on their foreheads. Why did they do that? Well, because Deuteronomy 6 says, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. So they did it. <laughs> Literally, God said, tie the words to your body. Couldn't be symbolism, no. So they did it literally. And just think, if my box is bigger than yours, my robes are longer than yours, my hat is taller than yours, my priestly garments are more decorated, my prayers are longer, my Bible is fatter, my sermon has more Bible verses, our church has more chairs, our church has more members. What's going on there? Why do we do this? Image, pride, vanity, rank, just like the disciples, right? Who is best? Who is greatest? <clears throat> the Pharisees do it, so the disciples do it. That's what everybody else does. When the event is over, key people get a diploma. They get a rank, they get a corner office, they get privilege, they get a parking space, they get a watch. They get employee of the month, they get elected. I have more views than you. I have more likes than you. There, there is celebrity and the rich, there are the kings and queens, and then there's everybody else. Tell me something, who is it all for? Who is this all for? Is it for you? It's for God. You know, Easter, like I said, is, is approaching. It's a couple weeks away. And I'm sure every other church is scrambling and they have deadlines and they've ordered stuff and they're deep cleaning and they're redecorating and they have a lot of special things planned. Here at Walden Church, we will have a nice Easter. It'll be a nice Easter, but for the most part, it'll be like every other Sunday. Why? I mean, we'll have all those visitors here. We should, we should go all out, right? This is our time to shine. We need to sell our church, don't we? Isn't Easter about trying to get visitors to become church members? Isn't Easter about trying to get visitors to become church givers? No. And woe to us if we ever turn the beauty of Easter into church marketing. If we do deeds, they are to be seen by him only. Our service is to God, to be seen by God. The Pharisees wanted to be called rabbi, to be seen by others. That was their downfall. They lived for earthly praise and earthly applause. Verse eight says, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers, and no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. What is that about? Because it sounds like he's trying to say that we should do away with what? Positions of authority? Titles? No. Jesus is still talking about pride, but he's shifting it. Now he's talking a little bit about reputation. Before he was talking about how they looked, okay? And now he's talking about how they are received. Remember, this is coming from Jesus, a man who was willing to lay down all of his titles. God became a human. Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't roll on his reputation here on earth. He, he didn't go up in reputation, he went down. Paul says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Jesus stood in a human courtroom and allowed himself to be judged and condemned by people that he made, right? And he never once stood on title or position to defend himself. But these scribes and the Pharisees were doing the opposite. 
They were calling themselves rabbi and teacher. They were the spiritual fathers. They were the instructors. But they did it with the wrong motive. Their motive was pride and vanity, and they wanted the glory. But Jesus' teaching here in Matthew 23 is about God being the only one who gets that glory. Because as Jesus says in verse 11 and 12, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. We've heard that before, haven't we? (laughs) The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. What do you think? I think Jesus means it. What does he say next? But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Have you ever wondered what it would be like if one Sunday Jesus just walked up in here and he took the pulpit and he began to preach? Do you ever wonder what it would be like if Jesus preached a sermon? It would be like this. The niceties are over. The gloves are off. This is where Jesus will now really rip into them. Verse 13 says, But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as you yourselves. Someone needs to tell Jesus that preachers are supposed to start with a joke, right? Like, a small church was raising funds for a new piano. And one Sunday, the pastor said, whoever gives the most money in the offering plate can pick out three hymns. So they passed the offering plate around, and the pastor saw a $100 bill in the plate. He says, look, we have a winner. Whoever gave this $100 bill can come to the front and select three hymns. An 80-year-old lady stood up. She walked to the front, and she pointed with her finger into the pews. I'll take him, him, and him. That's how you start a sermon. Remember that these Pharisees, they're not evil. They're not bad guys. They were religious men. And they truly had a passion for tradition and scripture. They attended synagogue regularly. They tithed. They prayed. They worked hard to teach people the law of God. And they were greatly respected in the Jewish community. But Jesus saves his harshest criticism for them. Look, even even now, um, we would say, well, did did they preach? Did they evangelize? Yes, they did. They evangelized. Jesus says, you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. So they would evangelize. But the problem with their brand of evangelism was, and and again, about them, not God. Each rabbi had a yoke that as their disciple, you had to follow. Some rabbis had a difficult yoke, some a little easier. And I seem to remember one rabbi, Jesus, who said, My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Tell me something. Can churches be like that today? Oh, you go to that church? I mean, I heard they do this. I heard they believe this. You know, at my church, we do this. As if to imply what? That someone is better? That that we get into heaven quicker? That that church is too big? That church is too small? That church is too young? That church is too noisy? What what are we doing? Hey, Jesus, which one of us is the greatest? Hey, hey, when, when we go to heaven, can one of us sit on your left and one of us sit on your right? What are we doing? Does any church have the monopoly on God? Does any one single church have the monopoly on truth? I mean, when you start to hear stuff like that, it feels more like a cult. Watch out for churches who teach that they are the only ones who teach the truth. 
Watch out for churches who say, do everything our way or else. This is exactly what Jesus is speaking against. Jesus says, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. What's the point here? Like Jesus, we have to have a light yoke. We have to have an easy burden, right? We have to make it easy for people to find heaven. In the next of Jesus' points, he goes further after the religious leaders for just making mountains out of molehills. He says, Woe to you, blind guides, who say, If anyone swears by the temple, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, for which is greater, the gold or the temple that was made that made the gold sacred. And you say, if anyone swears by the altar, it is nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift that is on the altar, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? So whoever swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears by it, by him who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits upon it. Jesus is talking about making a promise, making an oath, swearing, right? So why is he bringing up all this stuff about altars and temples? Well, it's all legalistic mumbo-jumbo. For instance, if a, if a Pharisee said, I swear by the temple, then it was like crossing your fingers behind your back. Because it could be argued that you didn't own the temple, so it's not yours to begin with. You don't have any right to swear by it, so your promise means nothing. If you swore by the altar, who cares? You're not legally bound to anything. But if you swore by the sacrifice that was on the altar, well, then you're bound because the sacrifice belongs to God. Why are these loopholes here? So they could weasel out of things. <laughs> so they could swindle Gentiles. Are their hearts in the right place? No. Is Jesus going to call them out on it? Yes. Look at the next one. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Jesus' next problem with the Pharisees is about uh, tithing, really. And again, it's all legalism. They, they measure out their money to the exact penny and it couldn't go a penny more. And Jesus says, you're being so legalistic. You're, you're, you're missing the forest for the trees. For instance, it's, it's unclean to swallow bugs. It's unclean to swallow a gnat. So to prevent it, they put a cloth over their cups so it would keep the bugs out. But according to the Old Testament, it's also unclean to eat a camel. So Jesus is making a joke and he's burning them at the same time. He is saying, you are trying so hard to keep yourselves pure that you are missing the entire point as to why the rules are there. What does Jesus care about? Legalism? Rule following? You want to know what one of Jesus' favorite Bible verses was? He says it in Matthew 9, 13. He says, go and learn what this means. And then he quotes Hosea 6, 6. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I, am, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus cares about people much more than he cares about rules and procedures. In the church, we always have to be on guard against legalism. It's easily the most common trap that Christians fall into. We get caught up in all the churchy procedures and rules. And we forget to have love and compassion for people. Love God, love others. That's one of our core values. And as such, we have to be people who show mercy and grace. We need to be people who show mercy and grace. Look at the next woe, verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence you blind Pharisee. First, clean the inside of the cup and the plate that the outside may also be clean. 
This one's a little more self-explanatory, right? But here, Jesus is using the religious leader's meticulousness in ceremonial washing to be an example of the condition of their heart. Jesus says, you spend a lot of time cleaning stuff. You spend a lot of time cleaning the exteriors of things, but your hearts are unclean. He says they are greedy, right? He calls them greedy. He calls them self-indulgent. Their inward holiness did not match their outward piety. And then he takes it a little further. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Dead bodies were also unclean to touch. And it was another thing that religious people didn't want to dirty themselves with. And that would also include a grave. Well, dead people were buried outside of the city wall, and which meant travelers who maybe weren't familiar with the topography, were not familiar with the area, they would have to cross through graveyards in order to get to your town. So to keep travelers from stepping over graves or from stepping onto graves, uh, the Jews would paint the tombstones bright white every time the sun started to fade them. And it was a warning to guests, don't walk here, this is where a dead body is. And Jesus compared the Pharisees to that, a grave that looks pretty on the outside, but inside is filled with decomposing flesh. And then he gives them another accusation, lawless, right? He called them greedy, self-indulgent, and lawless. That's a lot to take away. That's a tough one. We need to be people who hunger for holiness, right? That would be the opposite. Not cleanliness, right? We, we need our hearts in the right place, our motives in the right place. God looks on the inside. I don't, want to be com I don't want to be compared to a dirty dish or a clean tomb. I want to be holy in here. Look at the next woe. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of the fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers. The Jewish history was filled with people ignoring their prophets, even rebelling against their prophets, even killing their prophets. Because see, the ironic thing is, the Pharisees love the prophets and they revere them. And they say, if we had lived back then, we would have listened. We would never have done that. We wouldn't have taken part in the rebellion. We're better than that. We would have listened, but Dum, dum, dum. Jesus secretly knows that they want to kill him. What? Oh yeah, he knows. And Jesus says, hey, why don't you go fill up the measure of your fathers? That is the ultimate burn because he is basically saying, why don't you finish what they started? Yeah, I know, you don't want to be like your fathers and your father's fathers, but fellas, let's be real. When you kill me, you will be just like them. And then he closes with, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Listen. That is not what you call a bunch of religious people. Hellbound snakes. We need to be children of heaven. <sighs> I don't know about you, but I need a break. I need a rest. I, I need to sit down after all of that. I mean, where do you go after all of that? How do you, how do you, how do you recoil from that? How do you keep going? That was a lot to take in. 
might I suggest that you go back to the Sermon on the Mount? I know, I know, we skipped it. We skipped that, and the truth is, we were just saving it. We were just saving it for right now. The Sermon on the Mount begins in Matthew 5. Matthew 5 says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and this is his first big teaching. And might I add, it is the positive to all of the negatives. It is the yippies to all of the woes. At the very start of his ministry, Jesus pronounced seven blessings in Matthew. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Seven blessings. Those are the seven actions of the righteous. Those are the seven actions of the holy. In fact, you don't need my sermon points. If you are taking notes, th throw them away. Throw them away. You Jesus' notes are better than mine. Matthew 23 is a warning. It's the seven ways the Pharisees hurt themselves and hurt others. Why? Because they kept people out of God's kingdom. They took advantage of widows. They misled men to eternal destruction. They were covetous of worldly things. They refused to show compassion. And they were inwardly corrupt. And they were children of hell. Matthew 5 is the seven ways to please God. Matthew 23 is the seven ways to disappoint God. In our passage today, Jesus wasn't just sad. He was mad. He had had it up to here with these hypocrites and blind fools, and he knew his time on earth was almost over, so he lays it all out on the line. He doesn't, put, he doesn't pull any punches. He, he puts them in their place. So let me just offer this instead. Instead of us buying welcome banners and Easter signs and, and more signs to stake out in our lawn, how about you be a living banner for Easter? Instead of us scheduling extra greeters, how about you just be a greeter on Easter by being friendly, by being welcoming, by being a family? We're not looking for perfect people as if there are any. We want people to come just as they are because that's how God accepts them. And the way we show that is by having a love for God and a love for others. The world has enough judgment and the world has enough condemnation as it is. As Christians, we don't need to be heaping more burdens on top of the stress and drama that's already in the world. No, the message the world needs to see and hear is the message of God's love and grace. I'm a sinner. Following Jesus. How about you? I don't have it all together. And this admission, this authenticity, is our first step towards wiping away all of the brokenness that hypocrisy brings. We are all broken. The people inside the church need to let the people on the outside of the church know that it's okay not to be okay. The good news is that Jesus can redeem brokenness. So come as you are. At Walden Church, come as you are. You don't need to dress up. You don't have to put on uh, any particular outfit or dress a certain way. Uh, you don't have to be a particular age. Please don't feel you need to pretend your life is perfect. At Walden Community Church, none of us are perfect. And we welcome anyone, no matter where you are on your spiritual journey. Learn at your own pace. 
Jesus said, ask questions. Seek and knock, he said. We believe that you will find what you are looking for. You'll learn how to relate to God. You'll learn how to be a Christian in a community. And here's the big thing. You will change. You will change. But it'll be because God changes you. That's what makes following Christ a path of hope, grace, peace, love. We don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have it all together. No one does. You just have to try your hardest to be faithful, to love God, to love your neighbors as yourself. And when you mess up, as you do, we just seek God's forgiveness. And our, our record is wiped clean. The past is erased. There's no judgment. There's no condemnation. There's no heaping of more burdens. You'll just find acceptance and grace and love. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these teachings, and we know that even though they are harsh, they apply to us all. We ask that you would help us to take these teachings to heart, that we would learn from them, but more so we would be encouraged by them, that just because there are seven woes, there are also seven blessings. There are seven good ways to live, seven encouragements, seven wonderful ways to relate to one another. And we have that opportunity each and every day. This church is not here for Sundays only, and it's not here for Easter. This church is here for people who every day need what you offer. Lord, may the world know that their local church, not the fanciest church, not the biggest church, not the church with the billboards or the most heavily paid pastor, their, their, their church close by, their church next door, every church in America is a place where they can find Jesus. Every church in America is a place where they can find love and acceptance and grace. Lord, this is your bride. This is your bride and she is beautiful. May we be people who pour into your bride, who equip her and who make her shine like the light on the top of a hill. Lord, I pray for churches everywhere, for this coming Palm Sunday, for, for Good Friday, for Easter, for all of the services that will be taking place over the next few weeks. I pray for every single church everywhere across the world that those churches would once again see faces and people, and it will have nothing to do with banners or posters or ads in magazines. It'll have nothing to do with billboards. It'll have nothing to do with marketing. And it'll have everything to do with the beauty of your Son and the grace that he gives. Amen. Hey, I want to thank you for tuning in, for watching, for being a part of this. Of course, I'm going to say we'd love to have you here. We would love to have you here. We are here. We are available for you. Uh, we're a small local church in the heart of Montgomery, and uh, we have two services every single Sunday. Our first service is at 930. It's a traditional service, and you're going to see a choir, and you're going to hear all of your favorite hymns that you grew up with. Uh, in between our services, we have coffee and donuts, so you can stay long for the first one or get there early for the second one. And we'd love to have you come by and just meet some of us. Uh, we would love to have you be a part of this community. Uh, our 11 o'clock service is a Come as you are service. That's where our kids and youth also attend because we've got a full children's program. We have a youth program. Uh, we have a worship team on stage. And we're going to play uh, more contemporary, more modern songs. And then Wednesdays, if you've got kids who live in the area, it doesn't even matter if you come to our church or, or attend our church. We have youth group. And if you want to send your kids to a local youth group, we've, we've got you covered. So any kids from sixth grade through high school, we have a full program on Wednesday nights. It starts at six o'clock. We're so close. You can send your kids over on their skateboard or their bike or your kids could walk. We will feed them dinner. That's right, we'll feed them dinner and we'll send them home to you in about an hour and a half. If you have any questions, please feel free. Go to waldenchurch.com or call us, send us an email. We'd love to hear from you and answer those questions. We wanna be the church where you live. Thanks, I'll see you next week, bye.